Last of all, I'd like to read our sermon text, John chapter 19, verse 30, the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 30. And you'll remember that uh, this is the scene, is our Savior suffering, dying on the cross, and he utters seven last words as he is there on the cross, and this is the second to last word that he speaks. You may say, why is the last word? It seems like there are three words, but in Greek it's actually literally one word. John chapter 19, verse 30. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Let's pray. Our gracious God and our Father, we come now to listen to your word, but not just to hear it, but to believe it, to consider it, to live by it. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us by your spirit to receive it as we should with humble hearts. Help us not to be distracted by the busy things of the former week, the things that fill our minds, and rightly so, but help us to focus upon that one thing, that one thing necessary that cannot be taken from us. Help us now, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, several years ago, uh, my family had an exchange student from China for two years, and uh, it was a wonderful time to have you fallen among us. But I noticed that in her second year, she began to be a little bit more free uh, began to ask questions and say things that she would not have asked the first year. And she came to church with us every Sunday. She was not a believer, and she came every Sunday. And one time she said, says, Mr. Troxell, why is it that when you have a passage even this tiny, you still talk forever? <laughs> and I said, it's, it's not forever. It's 30, maybe 35 minutes tops. She said, no, it's like a century. <laughs> One of the things she did not understand is that it's very important that we explain scripture, that we explain what these words mean. This morning we have three words in front of us. It is finished. She would she'd be delighted to know that I'll speak at least 30 minutes on these three words. But it's important for us to understand what these words mean. It's, it's clear to us as we talk to people that they really do not understand the Christian faith as we begin to ask them questions or they ask us questions. I think there are many times, too, when we as believers think we understand. But our, our actions, or the way we even come to church, the way in which we think upon ourselves, shows that maybe we don't always understand it as well as we should. And so it's always good to come back to the most simple things of the gospel, as we will do this morning, and just consider these, these three words. You'll see there's an insert in your bulletin that has three points of the the headings of this, and those are indeed the outline this morning, and so I will repeat those. We read a passage like this, and the first word that comes to your mind is, well, what Christ is saying, that he's a finisher of the Christian faith. And in fact, as we think of the plan of redemption that is given to us in Scripture, it's very clear that it, it finds its culmination in Christ. It finds its point of culmination in Jesus Christ. And perhaps you're thinking, he's saying he's uniting all these things in himself. Because throughout history, as we read the Old Testament, it's God who gave us several pictures and glimpses and prophecies of this great redemption that was to come, or more pointedly, the Redeemer who was going to come. And in fact, is this not what Christ said in Matthew 5? He said, I did not come to abolish the law of the prophets. I came to fulfill them. Perhaps you'll be thinking he's saying something like this because, in fact, Christ did come to fulfill all these, these pictures and these symbols, or what we call types, in the Old Testament. He is, in fact, that deliverer who came from the line of Eve that would crush the head of the serpent. He is that prophet that Moses said God would raise up among his brothers. He is that priest, Scripture tells us, who comes in the order of Melchizedek. He is the king, the great king who is both the son of David and also David's Lord. He is the ultimate 
kinsman, kinsman redeemer that came from the line of Ruth and Boaz. And as he said, he did fulfill the prophets. We think of Isaiah, the many prophecies he gives of the sign of Emmanuel, the one who'd be uh, born and conceived by a virgin. He is that stumbling stone that became the great cornerstone. He is that shoot that rose from the stump of Jesse. And perhaps you're thinking most of all that he is that suffering servant described in Isaiah 53. This one whose stripes bring healing to us and whose death brought deliverance from our sin. He is Daniel's son of man, whose dominion is an everlasting kingdom. This is Zechariah's branch, who comes like a gentle savior riding upon a donkey. And in fact, we, as we think of these things, we look at verse 28 that precedes our verse. It says, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, he spoke these things. Why? To fulfill scripture. And in fact, these things speak to the fact that he has fulfilled scripture. He's fulfilled all of the old covenant worship. It's sacrifices. It's feasts like the Passover. It's priesthood. In fact, is that not the very point of, of the book of Hebrews? I believe your pastor is preaching through Hebrews uh, recently. And what's the main point of that book? Because we have a high priest. But he's a high priest of the new covenant. He brings something better than what we saw in the old covenant. He brings, he guarantees a, a better covenant founded on better promises and a better name. He purifies through a, a better ministry with better sacrifices and a blood that speaks a better word. He brings a better possession for a better hope and a better life and a better resurrection that underlines again and again and again. This is what we've been looking for. This is something better. So as we think of all these things that I've listed, and we could have listed so many more, Christ takes every single one of these strands and he brings them together and weaves them into, into one thing, namely himself. He brings them all to an end. And by an end, we mean that in terms of both the termination and the goal. Think of in a track meet, there is a finish line. And that finish line is a symbol of what? It's the symbol of the, the end of the race, but it's also the goal. It's the goal of every person in that race. And the same is true here, that Christ is the end. And he puts to an end everything that pictured him, everything that represented him. And so perhaps that's in the spirit of what we have here in the words of Romans 10.4. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. But perhaps we could put it in a crisp way that Hebrews 12.2 says that we are to look to Jesus, who is the, the forerunner and the finisher of our faith. He's the author and the perfecter, but finisher is a word that would, would fit there very well. But here's the problem. Jesus does not say, I am the finisher. Those are not his words. Everything I just said is true. But that is clearly not the emphasis that he's trying to make here in what he says. It's not the point. It's not the greater point that he wishes to make. And so that brings us to, to the second point. We titled Unfinished. Notice here what Jesus also does not say. He does not say, I have finished it. I have finished it. That's not what he says. It's true. Of course it's true. All the suffering appointed for Christ has ended. The penalty has been paid by Christ. The cup of wrath for sin has been drained by Christ. The worst is over for Christ. His suffering is finished. But he does not say, I have finished it. Because Christ, in this phrase, does not draw attention to himself. He does not want to make himself conspicuous. He's clearly not seeking the limelight in what he says and begin to boast of his victory. And neither is he expressing some sort of defeat. He's not saying something like, well, it looks like it's the end of the road for me. Or this is not some sort of sigh of personal relief where he says, oh, finally, my suffering is over and I am free. The point is not that. It's, it's actually very simple. Jesus is not the subject. He puts a spotlight on his work, on the it. He points over there to the it. It is finished. He points away from himself. Perhaps we can think of this in the way we think of a, of a gifted painter who's painting his, his painting and he adds that one final stroke of the brush. He looks back, examines the work, and he says, oh, it is finished. 
And that's similar to what Christ is doing. But what he's drawing attention to here is the masterpiece, not to the artist. He's looking away from himself. But notice what he also does not say. He does not say, I am finished. Let me ask you a question. And of course it's a trick question. Questions from the pulpit are always trick questions, so don't answer it. But let me ask you this question. Is Jesus' work done as a Messiah? Is he done purchasing our salvation? Has he completed all of his work that's necessary for our salvation? And the answer is clearly no. And the first thing you should go to in your mind is 1 Corinthians 15, which tells us about the resurrection of Christ and how crucial that resurrection is. And it says that if Jesus is not raised from the dead, then you and I, we are dead in our sins. So there's still the resurrection. There's still his ascension, where he rises to go to heaven so that he can procure for us the promised Holy Spirit that poured it out upon his church. Christ must ascend so that the Spirit can descend. There's still that. We're still looking for him to be seated at the right hand of majesty, with all rule and authority and power and dominion under his feet, so that he can build his church and protect his church and be there as a witness for his people and counter the accusations of the evil one and intercede for us and save us the uttermost. We still, we still need that. But then, of course, ultimately the second coming of Christ, where he comes and he, and he gathers to himself all of his church and brings them into that kingdom of glory so that they might inherit eternal life. We have all of this yet for Christ to do. So what is Christ saying then? I have just described to you two aspects of the work of Christ. There's his work of humiliation, which leads up to his death upon the cross. Then there is his, his work seen in his exaltation, his resurrection from the dead until he comes again. What he's saying here is that his work seen in his humiliation that is finished, but his work of exaltation, or his one work consummated his exaltation, that is not yet done. It's not even begun. It's interesting how Scripture puts this. On the cross of Christ, we hear these words, it is finished. But when you turn to Revelation chapter 21, I think it's verse 6, Christ says there, at the consummation of all things, he says, it is done. It's basically the same wording we have here. These are like bookends, the scripture is telling us. That when Christ comes to his death on the cross, he says, it is finished, speaking of his re work of redemption on the cross, but when the glorious kingdom of eternal life comes, there he looks upon all of his work, humiliation and exaltation, he says, it is done. And the beginning, the end, he says. You see, not until Satan is cast down and heaven and earth rolled up like a scroll and made new, not until the grave is absolutely silenced, not until death is placed under his feet and the gates of hell are closed, it's not until then do you and I reach the absolute consummation of our salvation. We can put it this way. It's not until Christ says so. So the totality of his work as a Savior remains unfinished. So what is finished? Well, as I was just suggesting, Christ does say, it is finished. He does not say, I'm almost finished. He does say, it is finished. This is what he set out to do in John 4, 34, as he speaks to the Samaritan woman. He says, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to finish his work. So something is finished. And what is it? It's simply this. Jesus is declaring that everything required for our deliverance from the penalty of sin is accomplished that Christ is sacrificing himself to remove the guilt of our sin, the corrupting power of our sin, the curse of sin, the misery of sin, even the sting of sin. And what he's saying is that with regard to sin, the debt of our sin is fully paid. The penalty of our sin is fully satisfied. The wrath against our sin is fully exhausted in him. And so by saying it is finished, he is saying there's no more burden left for anyone to bear. There's no punishment to face. There's no wrath to experience, no price to pay, no obstacle to remove. There's no curse here to bear. And with regard to those spiritual blessings that we enjoy in our redemption, there's nothing lacking. All that we need, every benefit, 
of reconciliation and peace and forgiveness and acceptance, he's saying, it is, per it is purchased here. Every righteous requirement that demands to be fulfilled by Jesus or that must be exacted from Jesus has been met. And so all the merit that his perfect obedience deserves has been obtained for you and for me because this atoning sacrifice for our sin is finished. And so we read here that he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He delivered up his life. Even in death, Jesus is not passive. Scripture is telling us he gives his life. He gives his life to God in act of obedience. This is his doing. We read in Scripture that, that Judas delivered Jesus over to the mob. We read that the religious leaders delivered Jesus over to, to Pilate. We read that Pilate delivered Jesus over to be crucified. But only Jesus can deliver up his life. It is his alone to give. This becomes the final act of his obedience on the cross. His life is not taken from him. It's not taken against his will. It is given because he wills it. And when? This is what he said in John 10. He said, the reason the Father loves me is because I lay down my life. No one takes it from me. He says, I lay it down in my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up. And this is what he is doing. This one who is lifted up upon the cross bows his head in worship, in completed work. And through that cross, Christ will draw all men, women, and boys and girls to himself that they might believe and know this forgiveness of sins that's available to every sinner because it is finished. Jesus says it is finished. Do you agree? Do you agree? I'm a Presbyterian. I'm not used to people responding. But... <laughs> well, that's what we're all supposed to say. But often I don't think we agree. I think as we talk to some of our friends who are not Christians, they would say, how can God forgive me for the things that I have done? There are other people, but they're good people. I can see why you would save them, but I'm beyond saving. But I think, too, as Christians, many times we say to ourselves, how can he forgive me when I keep doing the same thing over and over again? Or people will say things like this to themselves, that this was a good week. I think God really loved me this week because I was very obedient this week. I didn't sin as much. I didn't have as many failures. I didn't backslide as much. I think I was really more saved this last week. People think in those ways. And so they add to it, too. I heard somebody put it this way. Jesus offered up himself as your perfect sacrifice. You understand this and you would confess that he died for your, he died your death. He made full satisfaction for your sin with his blood. He's obtained an irreproachable righteousness for you. You confess these things. <clears throat> but, did, but you did your part, too, didn't you? You obey. You've made sacrifices. You have suffered. And now you say it's, it's truly complete. I think people think those, those ways. I remember one of the churches I served with a young man who was straying away from the church. And he met with me and our associate pastor. And we pleaded with him. We talked with him. But just as he was going out the door, he said these words. He says, I understand the gospel. I just need to get my life together, get cleaned up, and then come back to church. And my associate pastor said, that statement shows that you don't understand the gospel at all. You come to church, you come to Jesus so that he can clean you up. And you see all these things, these thoughts, and many other thoughts people have, that is not the gospel. That is not the gospel. The gospel is Christ saying it is finished. What we have here virtually is this, that Christ looks over all of the work that the Father gave him to do. He looks at the entire course of his life and, his, and all that he has done. He thinks of every miracle he's ever performed and every petition he's offered in prayer to the night, every syllable of his teaching, every insult that he endured without retaliation, all of his suffering that he endured without complaint. Without complaint. And he says, it's complete. 
It's perfection. And he says, I look at all that I've done. I don't see anything missing. It's, it's all here. Everything is exactly the way that it should be. It is finished. And scripture tells us that the Father looks upon this. It's virtually like him saying, I am satisfied. I'm well pleased. But are you? Isn't that interesting that when God looks upon the entire work of his creation, what does he say? It's very good. What is Jesus saying here about his redemptive work on the cross? He's saying it is very good. It's finished. It needs nothing more. My brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to believe the word of God. We need to believe what Christ says. But he understands that we struggle. And so he's given to us these words. He's also given to us the Lord's Supper, which testifies to the things that we're reflecting upon this morning. And it's the Lord's Supper that testifies to what Christ has finished for us, down to every last detail. When Jesus says it is finished, it's not just the end of his suffering he has in mind, but yours. The end of sin's disgrace, the end of that corrupting power of sin, the end of the weight of the guilt that would crush us. So the scripture says, who will bring any charge against us? And it says, not God. I mean, you do to yourself, but it's not God. It's God who justifies. Who's going to condemn us when in fact it is Christ who died and who rose and intercedes for us? It's Christ who says it is finished. And who's going to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? Scripture says there's nothing. Nothing in all creation. Look as far as your eyes can see, there's nothing out there that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. There's nothing that can separate us from this beautiful, pure righteousness and holiness that he's obtained for you and me. The Lord's Supper is meant to be Christ speaking to his people and saying, look here at these symbols and ask yourself this question, what more needs to be done? Where are the flaws? What is it that's lacking? Could you and I have a more pure sacrifice? Could we have a more effective ransom than what we have in Christ? A more sure redemption? Where are you going to find a greater love than what you see evidenced on this table? Where are you going to find more lasting peace or hope than what is obtained by faith in Christ? Could we hear a better word this morning then it is finished. As we come to the table, as we come to this place, as we face every day, we come with doubts that plague us. We endure those seasons of great sadness. We have things in our life that we are perhaps battling secretly that are hard, truly hard. And all of us come with the knowledge of our sin and our weakness and our failures. But this morning you need to listen. And Christ says it is finished. Let him have the last word. Let him finish. Gracious God, and Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these words it is finished. How powerful, how wonderful, how needful we are of them. And we pray that you administer them to us this morning. And as we leave this place, as we reflect upon them, especially in times of need, may your spirit apply them to us again and again and again. And show us the faithfulness of our Savior. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.